Hello, everybody. As I said before, my name is Christina Sinopoli. I'm the marketing coordinator here at Fruition. Um, before we get started today with our custom app development and service now webinar, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Fruition. Um, who we are. We are, how, we are how IT harnesses the power of the cloud. We were founded um, in 2003 and we're the premier partner of ServiceNow. Our main focus is that we're a cloud integration firm with an ITSM focus. We have over 100 cloud experts and we have helped over 150 enterprises implement, build, and manage mission critical cloud solutions using ServiceNow. Basically, we like to think of ourselves as a one stop shop for ITSM lifecycle. Um, we help you strategize. We can define a roadmap and processes for your ITSM implementation by applying our unique rapid workshop methodology. And we can also define your functional and technical requirements through on-site process workshops and our proprietary features matrix. We're also here to help you build. Through automation, education, and extending the ServiceNow platform, as Matt will show you today, we have built several custom built applications and unique fruition products on the platform. We're also here to help you manage and improve by providing remote resource solutions and continual service improvement as a service. You can partner with our consulting team to review your IT performance every month. And now that I'm on today's agenda, I'm going to hand this over to Matt, who's going to go through a custom app with you today. Thanks for joining. Great. Thank you very much, Christina, for the introduction. I'm very excited to be doing this webinar uh, today. Uh, we started talking about it about two months ago, and I've really been looking forward to the opportunity to show you custom development uh, in ServiceNow. Uh, it's certainly the most exciting aspect of ServiceNow from my standpoint uh, as an architect and somebody who's been involved uh, in quite a few implementations. Uh, and so uh, let's get started. Uh, today's agenda, we're going to take a look real quickly at some of the past custom development projects we've done. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about how we justify custom development in ServiceNow. Uh, what are the key decision points that drive, um, that drive you towards implementing a custom development solution? Uh, we're going to take a look at something uh, that Fruition has devised called five platform as a service layers. And it kind of helps you uh, break down uh, the approach from a technical standpoint uh, break down how you approach application development uh, in ServiceNow and uh, the benefits that you should expect to derive uh, from taking advantage of different features in ServiceNow. And then the most exciting part uh, is we're going to go into a demo that's probably going to last about 30 to 35 minutes. Uh, and I'm going to be building from scratch in ServiceNow. I'm going to be building a, uh, a recruiting application. Um, the recruiting application is going to allow um, the collection and, or tracking of uh, recruits, um, the extension of offers, uh, the scheduling of interviews, collecting feedback from managers, uh, sending notifications. Uh, we're going to do that all, I hope, in 25 to 30 minutes. So you're going to see a lot come together in ServiceNow and really get a sense of uh, the real power of platform as a service within ServiceNow. Uh, so the past development projects we've done, um, there's certainly more than what we have listed here. This is just some of the highlights. Uh, we built a custom access management solution uh, with custom web interfaces, uh, notifications, um, ticket, or I should say invitation-based uh, access management requests. Uh, and this was for uh, one of the largest beverage companies in the country, so it was a big undertaking. Uh, we've built the social data center for one of the big social media companies in the country. Uh, they approached the challenge of how to organize and uh, keep tabs on the assets in their data center. Uh, they approached the problem like, uh, like the problem of how do you keep track of your friends and what they're doing and what their status is uh, and whether you're subscribed to your friends or not. Uh, so that was an, a very interesting undertaking. Uh, we've worked in the uh, healthcare space, implementing a Medicare Part D claims and ticketing solution. Uh, we've implemented a learning management system in ServiceNow, which if you had joined us for our last webinar, uh, that was featured um, uh, at that time. So I encourage you to check out on our website, fruitionpartners.com. 
uh, if you want to learn more about the learning management system. That was also a very good demonstration um, of how to leverage platform as a service um, in order to uh, arrive at a custom solution. Uh, and we've done uh, more, uh, uh, more particular functionality in ServiceNow as well, not just end-to-end uh, -end workflow driven um, solutions, but also particular features in ServiceNow that we've added. Um, so we have a call center solution within browser Twilio VOIP. Uh, Twilio is a major provider of voice over IP backend services. Uh, and by partnering with them, we're able to offer uh, a dial pad within ServiceNow um, and uh, tie the conversations that occur over VOIP directly to incidents. Um, so there's a lot of cool stuff going on uh, on that front as well. And then finally, I've got a couple of slides on this last one. Um, with Key Energy, we developed an environmental health and safety solution. Uh, so Key Energy manages a lot of equipment in the field, oil rigs, pipelines, and so on. Um, I believe they're based in Texas. And the, uh, the solution that we built for them um, really took uh, some of the great disciplines and ideas of ITSM uh, and the way that ServiceNow has been built to support those great disciplines uh, and applied it to a whole new market, which is uh, uh, the market of, of energy, um, equipment management, field services, a lot of the same and very similar concepts as ITSM. So the challenge with them was that they had numerous field assets that required inspection, audit, maintenance, and reporting. Uh, and they needed to report to government agencies as well. So EHSS issues exposed the business to a tremendous amount of financial risk, legal liability, and regulatory concerns. Uh, so obviously in the same way that ITSM um, is an important part of an overall IT strategy, if not the IT strategy, uh, EHS is really central to the business mission um, of, key en of key energy. So leveraging the ServiceNow platform as a service um, offering, we were able to extend the concept of a CI within ServiceNow to cover field assets. We were able to extend ServiceNow workflows to help drive the field inspection process. Uh, we were able to leverage ServiceNow's pre-built mobility interfaces to allow field inspectors uh, to interact, to submit tickets, to check status, uh, to receive work assignments, um, all in the field. And we were able to uh, leverage some of the outstanding integration features in ServiceNow to rapidly build uh, custom integration with Department of Transportation for accident reporting. Um, so we're going to be diving into all of these aspects in more depth uh, so that you can see how some of these pre-built modules in ServiceNow save you a tremendous amount of time when it comes to developing a custom solution. In terms of justifying custom development, sort of at the outset when you're first thinking about it, uh, we put together this list of pros and cons to think about in your head as you're uh, as you're first uh, approaching a new custom development requirement within your own organization. And that can be custom development within IT, um, the need for some kind of custom IT application. And of course, ServiceNow is uh, perfectly suited to extend beyond IT as well. Uh, in fact, the sort of the history of ServiceNow and where it came from, from a technology standpoint, is that it has its roots really in a, in a platform solution. And speaking as a developer who's worked with it for two years, uh, and, and also speaking for other people who have come to the same conclusion, uh, as a developer, you realize real quick that what you're dealing with goes way beyond ITSM, and you're dealing with a platform that allows you to build things quite rapidly. So the pros of it are really, as I said, the speed of development is, the, is a huge positive. Uh, another pro is existing metadata. You know, if you've, got, uh, if you've got a lot of information about users, departments, groups, um, assets like CIs, um, there's just a ton of information in ServiceNow that either in part or in whole could be very useful for whatever custom application you're building. And so as easy as integration is in ServiceNow, this is even better than integration because the data is already in ServiceNow. You have existing schema in ServiceNow. So in just the way that Key Energy looked at CIs and realized its similarity uh, to their field assets, um, there's always going to be opportunities to say, hey, this new uh, feature that we're going after, this new, um, uh, this new component that we're trying to represent, 
using a table structure. This lines up really well with something that's already in service now. And so there's some, uh, some real savings uh, to be had by using some of that existing uh, schema. Um, one of the huge concepts of platform as a service is this notion that if you build on the platform and work within its uh, confines, you are, in a, sen in, a, in, a, in a sense, you're taking a big chunk of your QA and enhancement, and you're outsourcing it to ServiceNow. ServiceNow is going to take care of a lot of the QA of the underlying components that you're using to build your application in just the same way that Apple or Microsoft or another major platform, or I should say a traditional platform uh, provider, uh, is taking care of the, you know, debugging the compilers uh, and the debuggers and the logging. And, and they provide a lot of that value to the developer so they don't have to worry about it. Well, this takes it really beyond um, that traditional development paradigm. Uh, and now you have huge modules of functionality, workflows, and notifications. Um, all of that stuff now is being managed by ServiceNow, and you're just turning uh, a few switches to, to bring those into your application. Uh, another huge pro is that, that using platform as a service, and ServiceNow in particular, is going to enforce a design consistency. Uh, so people who approach your custom applications, say you build two or three of them over time, over the next couple of years, uh, people who know one are going to be, um, it, or even people who know uh, ServiceNow itself as, a, as an ITSM solution, uh, they're going to be able to jump right into these other custom applications and be familiar with the key components. And, the, and, and then another great benefit, which I love as a developer, there is zero environment setup. You log in and you start coding. Um, and that is, that's just a huge thing because, uh, you know, setting up IDEs, setting up a local web server, setting up a local database, or going and talking to somebody else about uh, having to get a database to develop on, um, having to you know, ask other developers to make schema changes. I mean, all of these things, uh, some of those disciplines can be imported into the ServiceNow process for, uh, for governance reasons. Um, but from a technical standpoint, you have the flexibility to decide to do that or not to do that and, and to put a lot of power in the developer's hands. Um, in terms of the, the downsides, um, there are web, web interface uh, limitations. Now, ServiceNow supports completely customized um, canvassing of, of uh, totally uh, from scratch web interfaces. Um, and we'll talk about a little bit uh, what that implies. Um, so really, the web inter interface limitations I'm referring to are just that if you choose to work within the confines um, of ServiceNow's pre-built web interfaces, uh, which there's a lot of benefit in doing that, uh, then just be aware that it's, uh, it's not the most attractive thing in the world. It's not going to blow people's hair back. Um, but it, is, uh, it, gets, it has a lot of functionality to it. Um, so it all depends on what your needs are, whether you're looking for an aesthetic experience. Uh, in the case of the, the 3PA access management solution and the social data center I mentioned before, both of those clients were looking for an aesthetic experience. So they built custom web interfaces. Um, from in, in terms of the, the actual nuts and bolts, the administration of ServiceNow, um, you know, it's, it's not really designed to facilitate um, um, separation of administration where one, administra one administrator is, uh, and by, when I say administrator, I'm referring to uh, somebody who's in charge of maintaining and developing within ServiceNow. So it's, it's, it, there's just not a lot of good features for um, saying, you know, this administrator, Bob, is responsible for customizing and developing uh, the recruiting application, uh, while this administrator, Sally, is responsible for maintaining the core ServiceNow ITSM suite. Um, so that's something to be aware, out it, aware of. It's, it's uh, certainly something you can, you can work with um, from a teamwork standpoint and a governance standpoint um, and a process standpoint, but from a technical standpoint, there's no nuts and bolts there. Um, to really allow you to separate administrative responsibilities. The development tools themselves are not the greatest. Um, there's a lot. I use um, the Eclipse IDE to write all of my scripts so that I get syntax checking and I have all of my scripts saved locally. But in the end, I'm still copying and pasting those scripts into ServiceNow and saving them into the database. Uh, you get used to it real fast, and the time that you lose on that is more than made up for the time you save by um, taking advantage of pre-built modules. Um, but it is something to be aware of, and for somebody coming from a de traditional development background, it can be a bit of a shock. There's the cloud security uh, aspect. Of course, ServiceNow is, is a secure environment. Um, they have um, outstanding uh, data center 
um, security policies, um, but there's uh, your own security policies, and you may be uh, uh, a, a shop that just doesn't allow certain types of information uh, to be hosted outside of your own data center. So that's, of course, a concern. Uh, in terms of the licensing model, um, doing custom development within ServiceNow um, could potentially have an impact on your, uh, on your existing licensing agreement with ServiceNow. Um, so that's something where early in your design process, as you sort of assess the scope and the audience of your new application, um, you need to take that scope and the audience and who the users are going to be uh, and take that to your ServiceNow sales uh, representative um, so that he can work with you um, on, uh, on the licensing impact. And then finally, of course, whatever application you develop is only going to be online. Uh, so people working in the trains or in airplanes, unless they have remote access, uh, they're not going to be able to use the application uh, while they're in the dark, so to speak. So just at a high level, you know, I'd love to be able to say you can develop anything and everything in ServiceNow, but of course that's not really true. Um, certain things are going to be a bad fit. Games, desktop publishing, high frequency trading, climate model modeling, Skynet, the matrix. I mean, some of these things are just beyond what ServiceNow is really suited to do. Uh, but what is, what is a good fit? If you have a workflow-driven application, if you're interested in record lists and forms, if you're interested in search-driven, uh, if you need to keep inventories of things, um, if you need out-of-the-box PC and mobile support, these are some of the things you can leverage in ServiceNow. Fruition's five uh, platform as a service stage stages uh, are infrastructure at the basic level, scripting integration and reporting um, as you start to expand and take advantage of more features in ServiceNow. If you expand further, then you start to leverage existing schema. Expand even further, and you start to leverage the great pervasive subclassing model in ServiceNow. And then finally, you can leverage the ServiceNow way, which is to conceive of your application all the way from the outset as a ServiceNow peer solution. From an infrastructure standpoint, you're really taking advantage of ServiceNow as a hosting and a database provider, and not a whole lot more. You're approaching your application like a traditional application, and you're saving some time and maintenance headaches and some scaling uh, worries. You're saving yourself those uh, concerns by building on ServiceNow, but you're not really taking advantage of uh, much more in the way of pre-built modules. Uh, but certainly you can start at that level and get some benefit right off the bat. You can expand and start to take advantage of scripting, integrations, and reporting within ServiceNow. So there's a lot of handy scripting calls you can make in ServiceNow to save yourself some time. What's really powerful, though, is the important transform and reporting. When you think about being able to develop a custom application and then having that application already in an environment where there's pre-built integration tools that get data in and out of the database, and there's also pre-built reporting as a turnkey solution that allows you to flip a switch and build a report on the application that you just derived, uh, those are powerful features to have alongside whatever your custom development is. You can go beyond that and leverage existing schema. I mentioned this during key energy. And so now you're starting to take advantage of workflows within ServiceNow and the triggers that are already present. You can use uh, pre-built work queues so that when a ticket or a record gets assigned to somebody, it automatically shows up in that person's work queue. There's notifications in the approval engine within ServiceNow. The approval engine is fantastic. And certainly there are plenty of use cases, uh, custom applications that can take advantage of an approval engine. The benefits are that you are re you're reducing your development time even further at this point um, because of the modules you're taking advantage of. And again, this really starts to highlight how you've outsourced platform testing and enhancement to ServiceNow by taking advantage of as much existing schema as possible. ServiceNow has an outstanding subclassing framework. Uh, I like to describe it as object-oriented on steroids. It takes the concept of using object-oriented design within a, in a coding context and expands that into uh, the database design, into the security model, um, into the user interface. Subclassing is a, is a really powerful um, aspect of ServiceNow. And as a developer, when you use it to your advantage, you can save yourself a tremendous amount of time. It's the exact same pitch that uh, people were making in the early 90s about object-oriented, but it's uh, taken to a whole new level. Uh, and finally, uh, from a security standpoint, um, there's a documented approach to security. So you're importing sort of an understood security model instead of having to roll your own. Um, and then as I mentioned before, there's a design consistency that you're, um, that you're benefiting from. Uh, the last bullet point, the self-adapting application. If you adopt ServiceNow's approach to 
application design where it's a data-driven design, um, then you can adapt an application to meet new requirements by setting up imports, for example. It's kind of an abstract concept, but it's, it's something to think about. Um, and then finally, the ServiceNow way. This is for somebody who's been working in ServiceNow in a long time. They can go to a requirements session and they can start thinking about design uh, principles in ServiceNow right from the outset. Um, ServiceNow is going to let you rapidly conceptualize like we're going to see today. And really, there's, uh, the benefits of this is now you've reached the bare minimum of development effort. You've reached the absolute maximum of, of outsourcing your QA and enhancement effort to ServiceNow. You've minimized the amount of code that you have to maintain. And you've really provided the ultimate in design consistency. Uh, so with all of that in mind, uh, we are ready for a demo. Uh, so I've got my notes here on how we're going to build out this recruiting app. And uh, I, hope, uh, I hope this goes as well as it did for me when I practiced this morning. So here we are on service now. I'm logged in as a system administrator. And so what we're going to do is build a custom application on the left-hand side, a new gray bar. And it's going to be called recruiting. So the first thing we're going to do is build a uh, table. My application is going to have a couple of tables in it. Um, but the first one I'm going to call um, recruit. And this record is going to represent, um, this is going to re represent the actual, uh, the recruit him or herself. And um, I'm going to extend the task table because there's a lot of functionality in terms of workflows and notifications and approvals uh, that I want to leverage um, in, this, in this particular case. And when you think about a recruit, a recruit is a, it, it's a person, but it's also, in, the, in terms of the hiring process, it's something that goes through several stages. And so that's why it's appropriate um, to think about using task in this situation. I'm going to create a new application on the left-hand side called recruiting. And I think we're ready to go. Okay, great. So we've got our recruiting table. Now it's got, uh, by default, it's got all these fields on it that's related to task. And I'm going to get rid of a lot of them and start putting in my own fields. So let me, uh, let me do this real quick. Get rid of all of these guys over here. Let's start putting in some of my own fields. Uh, so we've got, uh, we want to track the name of the recruit, right? So we've got a string field there for their name. We're going to capture their email for, for uh, notification purposes. We're going to put in a date uh, to represent when the recruitment process started with this person. And we're going to track who uh, referred this person to the company, which is going to be an existing employee who's going to be in the, oh, shoot. Oh, sorry about that, folks. I just. Uh, accidentally hit back. So there's one of your cons, the not so great development environment. Uh, so let me try to do this again real quick. So we need name, we need email, we need recruitment started, which is a date time field. Uh, we need referred by, as I said, so this is going to be a reference to an existing to an existing user in the user table. Uh, we've got hiring department. And that's going to be department. Uh, again, we're leveraging existing metadata, your, your list of departments. Hiring manager. That's going to be a reference to your user table again. Uh, we've got uh, status. That's going to be a choice field, and we'll take a look at choice in just a second. And we have the last salary that they had, should they choose to share that during the recruiting process. And then we have the minim minimum salary expectation. I'm putting these fields in um, not to recommend to you how to conduct your recruiting, but rather to show you some uh, security features that you can use within ServiceNow. Uh, there's a real quick question that went out there. When configuring the form, would you want to use fields that are out of box? The answer to that is yes. Um, I'm trying to save a little bit of time by not going through a, an in-depth review. 
Uh, but there are already some reference fields out there. There's a notion of assigned to. Uh, assigned to is a reference to users. Um, you might decide that assigned to is an appropriate field to use on your own application, as an example. And certainly, there's other fields out of box. Um, I'm using the lever. I'm using the number uh, field that's out of box already. Um, but most of these are actually pretty recruiting specific. So I'm I'm comfortable with um, breaking out some custom fields for these. And of course. These fields are only being added to the recruit table. They're not being added to the task table that I extended from. All right, so we've got our recruit table roughed out. And um, what we're going to do is uh, clean up the form a little bit. So I did this earlier. Hopefully I can. <clears throat> we're going to put the, the name, the number, the email uh, on the left. And then what we're going to do is kind of put status related information on the right, um, I'm going to put referred by up here, um, hiring, and uh, status, last salary, and that's fine. So let's just, let's do it that way. All right. So that's the recruit table. Now what we need is we need two related tables to this, right? So we're going to do two things. We're going to do offers and we're going to do interviews. So let's uh, build a table called uh, a recruit. Actually, let me do interview first. Recruit interview. Again, I'm going to extend task because an interview is uh, something that needs to be assigned and completed. And um, you know what? I'm sorry. There are a couple of questions going out there. Um, let me try to come back to them at the end and address them because um, I'm, you know, I want to get this done for you in the next half hour, um, so you can really see a lot of different things. So. Uh, let me come back to those questions. You can keep them queuing up, but I'm going to um, keep going here for a minute. So I'm going to put this new new thing in an existing application we call uh, recruiting. And uh, uncheck this. Create new module. And OK. So what this is going to do is now put my table uh, into the um, <coughs> into the left hand. Uh, navigation for me. So now I've got recruit and I've got interview. Okay, so let's go into the interview table now and uh, get the fields that we want here. So I'm going to get rid of this stuff. And again, there might be some out of box fields that make sense to use right here, but uh, I'm not going to go through them. So what we need is a we need a reference to the recruit, right? We created a ref we created a recruit record or table already. So what we want to do is reference that from the interview. Who is this interview for? It's for a particular recruit. It's a recruit record. Then we're gonna make we're gonna find out who the interviewer is. Uh, that's gonna be a reference to the user table. Now here, this would be a perfect example where maybe using the out of box assigned to field makes more sense. Um, we need the interview date. And we need uh, what kind of interview it is. That's going to be like a technical interview or a team type of interview. Really, that's kind of for reporting purposes, maybe. Uh, then we need some notes. And again, there's some out-of-box comments and work notes fields on the task table that you could be using here. Uh, but I'm going to just create a new one here. Uh, notes are journals because you'll see how journal entries work where your your entry gets cleared out every time you make it and saved into a log and then finally we need sort of an out uh, sort of a, an outcome or a recommendation that comes out of the uh, the interview process um, okay so here's our uh, here's our uh, recruit screen and uh, we have a couple of choicelets on here that we're going to want to personalize. So let's put some choices into this drop down. You know what? I think there was a choice back on the recruit thing that I need to do too. Um, so I'm going to just put two choices in here, technical or team. And uh, that one you're going to, I'm going to leave none as an option. So you have to actually pick one of those two things rather than having it defaulted. And I'm going to do the same thing for choice or I'm sorry, for recommendation, um, you're going to have to pick one of the options. What I'll show you on some of the other um, uh, some of the other choices is that you can also pick a default and take away that none option. Do not hire. 
So there's your recommendations coming out of an interview. And uh, so that table is taken care of for now. Maybe we'll come back and fix a few things up. But let's get our third table in here. Oops. That's not what I wanted. I want to go to tables and columns. And now we're going to create, finally, we're going to create a recruit offer. And uh, this, again, is going to extend task, the recruit offer. Um, I'm going to show you workflow on this. It's going to go through a workflow where the offer, uh, once it's entered, it has to go to the director uh, within the, or the department head, I should say. The department head has to approve the offer. Uh, and then once they approve it, uh, it's actually going to auto-compose an email um, and send it to the recruit. Kind of aggressive. Uh, probably wouldn't do that in a real recruiting application, but it's, uh, it's going to give you some ideas. Uh, and so we're going to create this in the existing uh, recruitment application on the left hand side instead of breaking out a new gray bar. So let's take a look at our recruit application. So we've got recruit, recruit interview, recruit offer. Now I haven't set up, I haven't personalized the columns on the list view yet either. I've only been focusing on forms, uh, but we'll take care of that in just a second. So let's take care of recruit offer. We've got a number. We need that uh, right off the bat. Then we're going to do an offer date. And we're going to do extended by. And this is going to be a uh, reference to the user table. So this is the person that uh, actually reaches out to the person and makes the, uh, and makes the offer. And then we're going to have a status on the offer. Again, this is going to be a choice. We'll put those choices in in a minute. And we're going to have a salary, uh, what was offered to them as compensation. Um, and let's see. We're going to do a description of the offer. This is sort of a free form area uh, where the job roles and responsibilities are going to be described by the, uh, the person extending the offer. Uh, and uh, we're going to do a notes field which again is going to be journal. And I think that's probably all we need for now. So now we have the recruit offer. Oh, you know what? There's one more thing I forgot. We need the reference, like on the other one, we need the reference to which re recruit refer, uh, I'm sorry, which recruit record uh, this offer is actually related to. So let me put that up here. All right. So we've got our tables. Let me set up some list forms and then you're going to see some things come together really quickly here. So let me personalize the list layout. And uh, instead of having these out-of-box task-related fields, I'm going to pull in uh, some of the key things um, uh, that I set up. So the name of the person, uh, the status. Oh, you know what? I should mention, um, did I do a status field? Uh, I think I did. Let me save this list layout real quick and take a look here. Yeah, I did status. Yeah, so why wasn't that on the... Now status, here's a perfect example. There's an out-of-box field on the task table called state, uh, and it might make sense to use that state field here as well. There's uh, reasons to do it both ways in the case of status. There we go. Um, and uh, that's probably a discussion for another time. So we've got uh, status on here, and then we're going to put in, um, is there anything else we need for the recruit? Uh, maybe the hiring department and the hiring manager. And, uh, and maybe the, recruit, the recruitment started date. I'll put that right up next to the name. And, uh, oh, you know what? Yeah, that should do it. Okay, so now our, our list looks a little bit better. These, these fields or these columns are relevant to the recruitment process. Uh, let me do the same for interviews. I'm not going to get rid of this. And I want to know who the recruit is. So that's going to be that. And I want to know um, the interview date. And probably maybe the outcome as well, which I think we called recommendation. And who the interviewer is. So we've got the interviewer, the interviewer date, and the recommendation. We're going to see that in this list here. And finally, we get to the offer. So 
So we'll take the everything but the number out. And the offer is going to, again, tell us who the recruit is that we're interested in, who the offer was extended by, uh, the offer date, Uh, actually, we probably want the recruit first, and then it's extended by. We can put the salary on here and the status. Oh, you know what? I think I probably want status on uh, some of these other fields as well. So we've got status there. Let me put uh, status on this field, on this list layoff for recruit as well. So uh, that is going to be. Why does status keep just throwing me off? Is that on here? Oh, it is on here. Oops. I'm going to put that at the end for, for consistency. Okay. All right, so now we've got a recruit record. We're going to recruit a guy named John Newsom. His email is John Newsom. Now what I'm doing here is, is getting some data in here just for development purposes. Um, and I'm going to have uh, Beth Anglin be the referral. The sales department is the, uh, uh, sales department is the hiring department. Uh, we're going to start the recruitment process uh, this coming up Monday. Oh, let me save this record and get some choices into this um, into this choice field. So, the state, the status of the recruit themselves are that they start out as a new entry, and here's an example where we're going to default it to new entry. So nothing's really been done with them yet, other than a record. Then they go into interviews. Then they go into having an offer extended. And then they get into some of these states where they actually uh, sort of close out. So they have declined, declined offer, and then not hired, and then hired. So a so couple of potential outcomes there. And what we're going to do is set up the dictionary on here uh, to default it to new entry. And I'm going to take away, now I can, by doing the default, I can take away that none option. So now we have a default of new entry. So every new recruit I start starts out as a new entry. All right, now watch this. This is awesome. So I've got those related fields or those related tables out there called recruit interview, recruit offer. They both relate to the recruit themselves, right? So a recruit can have multiple interviews. A recruit can have multiple offers. It's a, a many to one, one recruit, many offers, many interviews. Uh, so what we're going to do is... Um, we're going to bring those lists right onto this form. Uh, so I'm going to do recruit offer here and recruit interview. That. Now this is cool. So I'm ready to make an offer. So actually, let me rearrange the layout of this form. OK, so let me get some demo data in here again. So what I'm going to do is. Um, I'm going to have Beth do an interview. Uh, I'm going to have her do it on the 14th. And I'm not going to put a recommendation in yet because she hasn't actually conducted the, uh, the interview. So now I can save this. So now I have this uh, interview record down here. Oh, you know what? Let me do one more thing. You notice how these numbers, um, how they have uh, the task in front of them? You can actually customize uh, the numbering um, system that you want to use. So we can do, um, for the table, you recruit. Oh, here's something else I didn't mention. When you create custom tables and custom columns, everything in service now automatically gets prefixed with U underscore. Uh, the U stands for um, user, so it's like you know it's a user table or a user column. Um, so the table we actually created earlier is called U recruit, uh, and the number I'm going to give it is something prefixed with something that looks like recruit. And I'm going to do one more for actually two more. I'm going to do U recruit interview, uh, which I'm going to say is INTV, and I'm going to do you recruit offer, and that's going to be OFFR. All right, so now when we go back to our sample records, the ones that are already out there I think might already have the number associated with them. I should have done it earlier in the process, but I can change them. So I'm just going to change this to, actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to get rid of get rid of that record, and I'm going to get rid of the John Newsom record and just recreate it. And then you'll see this numbering thing in action. 
Okay, so new recruit. Uh, there we go. So here's recruit run. Uh, John. John Newsom. Oops. John Newsom at example.com. And Beth Anglin is the referral sales. Beth is also the hiring manager. Recruitment's going to start on Monday. New entry, that's all fine. So we can save that. We can also put in uh, put in that interview record again. So we'll have Beth start an interview with him. Uh, she'll do the interview on the 13th. And see how the numbering here now picks up interview. OK, cool. So we've got that. We can also put in an example of an offer. Um, so we'll be ready to extend this offer on the 15th. It's going to be extended by Beth. Oops. Oops. There we go. And now some of these fields you actually have to visit the record themselves. So let me save this and then show you how you can click through to the underlying records. You can just go right through the recruit offer here. I can go right to the interview. Right. Cool. All right. So a couple more modules on the left hand side. Uh, we've got these modules here that um, are. Uh, uh, sort of general. They show the complete table in ServiceNow, all the records, uh, but they're not really relevant to particular users. Not, they're not relevant to people like uh, Beth Anglin. Um, they're not relevant to the department head or anything like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, first of all, we're going to order these elements that are already in here. Oops. And then I'm going to start putting a new one. Um, I'm going to put in a new one called My Recruitment. And this is going to be used to, um, to show some uh, record lists that are relevant to the actual user um, that is the user that is actually using um, uh, the end user, I guess I would say, rather than the administrator. All right, and then what I'm going to do is take these modules that are already here. And uh, I'm going to associate them with a new role. So using role-based security, I can set up a special set of users called Recruitment Manager. Okay. So what we're going to do then is have, uh, I'm going to go in and assign Recruitment Manager to this guy, Fred Luddy, because he's going to become our department head. And he needs to see all records. And he has the permission to see all records. So I'm going to have. Recruitment manager in there. You can see I was practicing earlier with something called excruiting. Uh, so he's got recruitment manager. Okay, so now what we can do is using that role, and I'm gonna actually I'm gonna impersonate Fred in just a minute, so you can actually see what Fred sees, uh, or and and also impersonate Beth, so you can see what she sees as well. So now I can go into this application, and actually. Uh, uh, I'm going to actually associate these now to this recruitment management role. So by re associating with recruitment management, what I'm saying is these these lists that are supposed to show to absolute, you know, that show all records in the system rather than records that are relevant to the current user, um, just make these available to the manager. Uh, take them away from everybody else. We don't want them to see it. So that's recruitment manager and. Recruitment manager here. And finally, my recruitment will do recruitment management as well. And then everything that follows is going to be a module with no special roles on it so that it's available to everybody. So we're going to do one called My Recruits. The table is going to be the recruit table. All right. And the orders, I think we're up to 500 now. And look at this. This is really cool. The filter we're going to put on it is it's going to be <coughs> who, who are my recruits? The recruits are the people who are either referred by me. This is ServiceNow language for uh, me. That's me. Me is whoever's logged into ServiceNow and using it. All right. And actually, I'm going to say either that or either they're referred by me um, or I'm the hiring manager. So in either case, 
they should show the mic here. So let's take a look at Beth Anglin real quick. Beth has a module on the left-hand side now called Recruiting and a link called My Recruits. And see how the John Newsham shows up for Beth now? I'm impersonating Beth. I'm not an administrator anymore. She just goes down to re Recruiting. She clicks on My Recruits, and there's John. She can also create a new one, uh, and it'll default. Uh, it'll have her as the default there. Um, it's smart enough to figure that out from the, uh, from the filter. Right, so this is how Beth would actually interact with things. She would come in here and create things through this sort of view. So I'm going to go back to administrator, do a few more things, and then we'll uh, get on to workflow. We've got about 12 minutes left. Uh, we're doing great, um, but I'm, I'm starting to sweat a little bit, so I got to keep moving here. All right, so we've got our interviews, we've got our offers. Uh, let me do one more module on the left hand side called My Interviews. And this is going to be the, uh, sorry, the recruit interview table. And now here's something cool. Uh, this is going to be 600. The filter for this one is going to be the same concept. It's uh, uh, actually no, this isn't the cool thing I was going to show you. This is pretty straightforward. So this, the filter is going to be um, the interviewer is me. And remember, that's JavaScript for me. All right. Cool. So Beth now should see this interview directly under interviews as well. She can see it either through the John Newsom record by clicking through and seeing interviewer, or she can go directly to interviews. She has the choice, right? And if she goes directly to interviews, she can click through and get back to the recruit record. It's all related. Okay? All right. So we've got recruit, we've got interviews, we've got offers, right? So what do we want to do last? I think to round out our demonstration today, uh, what we're going to do is do a workflow on offer. Oh, actually, you know what? I think there's one more thing I thought of that we could do. Um, uh, on the offer, we didn't do a status, so let me do some statuses on the offer. Oops, I'm Beth Anglin. I need to go back to system administrator. <coughs> see, and now look at the administrator, right? The view the administrator has has these other tables in it where you can see all records. And oh, by the way, since we gave that manager role to Fred Luddy, he also sees these tables here, right? Uh, this impersonate feature is awesome. I don't know. I hope you're catching it because I'm going. I'm using it real fast. All right. So um, what are we doing here? Oh, so I said I wanted to personalize the states on. Uh, on offer. So let's go into, or I should say status. So let's go into this choice list and put some statuses in here. So for offer, what I came up with was a disappointingly long list of states. I hate long lists of states. It always makes development complicated, but sometimes they're unavoidable. Approved, extended. So the approval here refers to the department head, extended. The, the department head uh, approving the offer before it's extended to the um, accepted, Ex uh, before it's extended to the candidate. And this one, too, we can set up a default value. We'll have all of these start in draft, and we'll take away the none option. All right. Cool. And I'm going to put some... Uh, I'm going to put something cool on here called activities, which we're going to see how that works in, in a little bit here. And I also need to turn on, in order to use activities, what activities do is they show you sort of an audit trail of every field that you, or at least the ones that you track, every field that's uh, updated or altered by somebody. Uh, and we're going to use that. So we can see here this record started as something created by system administrator. Uh, with low impact and low priority. Now we should get rid of those because those are task specific. So maybe what we'll do instead is just put in the status, uh, the notes, and uh, maybe salary to see if the salary has been adjusted up or down based on successive offers. Um, and I think that should pretty much do it. 
All right, cool. So we see the salary started at zero. Now I can bump this up to $75,000. And now we see logged here that the draft, we see the draft status in 75000 So everything gets tracked in activity. Um, I think, okay, so here's the idea I wanted to show you. So there's something called business rule. Let's say that as soon as an offer is accepted, let's set the parent record, the parent recruit record. Let's set the state on that uh, to hired. Okay, so I'm going to do a new business rule, set recruit to hired once offer accepted. All right, now what are the conditions? The conditions are, well, when does this run? First of all, it runs after uh, the record has been inserted or updated, and the conditions are going to be uh, that the, sta the status equals... Um, accepted. All right. And actually, I'm going to put that up in the condition. And then what happens when that status is met? I'm going to open up a uh, recruit record here. I guess I could just put the R or the E in there. I'm not really saving very much there. New glide record. And this is U recruits. It's the name of the table. I'm going to get the current record. Or I should say a ref I should get the recruit that's referenced in the current record, uh, which is going to be this guy right here. And I'm going to update the value on the status. It's going to be hired. And then I'm going to update the record. Cool. So let's just demonstrate that real quick. Uh, if I go back to my uh, recruiting app, go to an offer. Uh, set the state to accept it. Now, we haven't built the workflow yet, so this is kind of cheating. Uh, but now if we go to the recruit record, we see that his, oh, shoot, status didn't work. That should be hired. Well, it worked when I did it this morning. I don't want to take more time on it, but you get the idea of the business rule uh, being used as a way to control values on other records. So what I'm going to do now is create a real quick workflow on the offer table. And this is going to be on the recruit offer. And the condition here is that we're going to wait for the status to flip to waiting for approval. And that's what's going to kick off this workflow. So uh, status is waiting approval. All right, so what's going to happen? Well, we're going to have uh, we're going to have the department head approve this record. Now watch how cool this is using those reference data types. Watch how easy it is to identify the department head. So we're going to name this activity. We're going to call this department head approval. And then we have to identify the user. Oops, that's not what I wanted. Click this little field icon here, and I can, I can sort of walk to the approver here, right? So the approver is going to be the recruit, hiring department, department head. See? Recruit, department, department head. It's going to pull it into this record and send an approval request to that person. What happens if they reject it? Uh, if they reject it, what we're going to do is just do a simple reverting of the state back to draft. So we're going to say status is going to go back to draft and maybe just put something quick in the notes. Offer rejected by department head. Okay. And set it back to, and so now the offer goes back to draft. If they approve it, then what we can do is set the state to Approved. I'm really under the gun. Uh, all right, status is approved, and uh, I think that's all we need here. And then what's going to happen is we're going to wait for somebody on that record to flip the uh, status to offer extended. Uh, so let's see, we're going to wait for we're going to wait for the status. 
to go to offer extended. And after we wait for it to go to extended, so somebody will flip that status drop down to extended, we're going to automatically email the recruit and extend them the offer over email. How do you like that? So who is this email to? There's a little bit, it's kind of a lot to explain, but I'm going to send it to offers at example.com. And then what I'm going to do is CC the, uh, the candidate. So I'm doing a little email script here. I'm sending this email to the recruit right here. You see how it says current recruit? Ooh, you know what? I have my old uh, practice names in here. So this is recruit email and recruit name. So it should bring in those attributes. And uh, it says congratulations. Here's a description of the offer we're making, and here's the salary we're offering you. All right. We're going to give this a shot. And we've got two minutes. This better work. All right. So we've got. Uh, now, in this one, we have an offer here that was accepted. The good news is it didn't update the status on this parent record anyway. Um, so, uh, and actually, you know what? Now that I've got a workflow, maybe a bus instead of using a business rule, um, I could, uh, instead of using a business rule, I could do that in the workflow instead anyway. So just ignore the record that's already there. I'm going to do a new offer here. Again, I'm going to have Beth extend the offer. Oops. And uh, save the record and go into that offer in detail. Oops, that's 13 here. Okay, so we're hiring you for um, your position. We'll be sales associate two, and uh, we'll do some notes. Uh, if there's any questions whether this is going to be recorded and posted, it will be on fruitionpartners.com. Um, so you'll be able to uh, finish anything we miss in the last two minutes. We're real close. So I'm sorry for going over a little bit, but uh, you will be able to uh, see the recording posted online. Uh, no notes, actually. So your position will be sales associate, too. And we're going to put this right into a waiting for approval. All right. So now, if we go and look at Fred Luddy, under my approvals, he should have an approval record here. Oh, thank goodness it worked. He's got, look at this, my approvals is out of box. I didn't even have to set that up. So Fred Luddy can just come here. He can see that the, he needs to approve an offer, right, right on his queue, along with change requests and everything else. And you can slice and dice these lists, so that, you know, make it off, you know, recruiting specific if you want. But there is this one that's uh, out of box here. So he can click through and, and he can take a look at the offer um, that's being offered. The salary is zero. I'm guessing that the person's probably going to decline unless they're like a really eager intern or something. Um, so he's going to say, I approve this. So now let's flip back to administrator. Or actually, we don't need to because we set up Fred as a overall recruiting manager so he can see all records. And if we look back at John Newsom's record, uh, go back into the offer, uh, we see that it's an approved state. So maybe Beth comes back in here, or maybe Fred himself says, OK, I'm ready to extend this offer. So he's going to click Save. right? So what does Save do? Save is supposed to send that email. And we're going to see that email down here in the activity in just a second, if it works. Better work. Better work. I was doing so well. Um, that really is the extent of the demonstration, though. Uh, we'll give the email just another minute or two here to generate. Um, Oh, I know what I need to do. There, the email delivery is turned off because this is a um, this is a development instance. So what I need to do is go into the email log, mark something as sent. So here's the offer. It did, and I'm just going to mark it as sent, as though the SMTP server had come in and picked it up. So now, if I go back to that uh, offer record, Oh, come on. Oh, you know what? My activities need to show sent and received email. So here's this nice activity log of all the states, who changed the states, who set the state to approved, 
Uh, and then it has this nice record of the email that was sent to John Newsom. Congratulations, we're pleased to extend you an offer. Your position will be sales associate too. That came directly from the description. Your salary will be zero, so have fun. Uh, I apologize for going over. Let me flip back to the demonstration. Um, it was a ton of fun. Um, I want to leave you with some fruit for thought. This is a great quote from Steve Jobs. He was talking about the benefit of using pre-built modules back in 1997, sort of in the, in the phase or the paradigm that preceded the new paradigm of pro platform as a service today. But the principles are the same. It's how do you save time for developers and allow them to build great apps. Um, up at the top, uh, we have some methods to stay in touch with us. I would encourage you to go to fruitionpartners.com. Um, and and uh, from there, you'll be able to link to our Twitter feed, our Facebook, and LinkedIn. Reach out, stay in touch. Um, certainly, you can uh, get in touch with me um, and uh, send any questions my way. Again, I'm sorry we went over, but I hope you enjoyed the demonstration. Thank you very much.